Hey everybody, welcome back to the second part of our absorption lecture. We left off here talking about the solid water distribution coefficient, which we called KD. And I told you that KD is a real problem because it's a quote unquote equilibrium constant, but things are not at equilibrium and it makes some assumptions that are just generally not true. So let's go talk a little bit more about those assumptions. And uh, so we're going to get into the topic of sorption isotherms, right? So the sorption isotherm describes the equilibrium partitioning between the sorbed, excuse me, sorbed and desorbed phase. The sorption isotherm is a plot of the concentration that is sorbed, Cs, versus the concentration that's not sorbed, which usually in our systems is going to be Cw, the concentration in the aqueous phase. But if you're dealing with the gas phase, it could also be concentration in the gas phase. And the thing is, sorption isotherms can have a lot of different shapes. Sometimes they're linear, right? Okay, so this is, I had to sort of split this plot up, but on all of these plots, the y-axis is Cs, which is the concentration sorbed, and the x-axis is axis, say that five times fast. The x-axis is Cw, uh, even though it's not explicitly written here, this is Cw, Cw. Okay, so sometimes this sorption isotherm is linear. Yay, it's linear, life is easy. That means Kd, which we have just defined as Cs over Cw, right? Cs over Cw is then the slope of that line and it's constant because the slope ain't changing. So then Kw is constant and you can get away with using this very simple formulation. But in reality that usually doesn't happen. More likely you see either a B here, this, this isotherm, this is where the isotherm starts to curve downward. So if you think of you know Kd as being the slope of this line at any given point, here the slope is a little bit less and here the slope is more. So the slope is getting to be less and less as, as the amount of chemical that is sorbed continues to increase. And you can think of the slope, as, I mean, slope is KD, right? And the higher KD, i.e. the higher the slope, the larger the affinity that the solid phase has for the chemical. So what this is saying is that as the slope gets less and less, it means that the affinity of the solid phase for the chemical is getting less and less as you sorb more and more of the chemical to it. So you could think of this as the chemical is changing the properties of the, of the surface that it's sorbing onto. And this can certainly happen when you start to have an awful lot of chemicals sorbed onto your, your um, solid matrix. Maybe it's taking up all the good sites. And of course, it's going to take up the best sites first. You know, you're moving into an apartment building. You take the best, the best rooms first, the ones at the top floor, the ones with a nice view, the ones with the big closets. You take them first, OK? But then as you get down to the bottom, pretty soon people are, are left with the dregs. They're living in the basement. They have no view at all. They're in the stinky apartment, you know, the one with the ugly walls. You know, you do what you can. So the affinity for, of the solid phase for the chemical is getting less and less as the absorption isotherm increases. That's why it's curving downward, okay? Sometimes this happens in a more dramatic fashion. You start off pretty much linear. That was, that was really bad. <laughs> Let me try rewriting that get up my eraser. Woo, erase. Okay. This is so fun. I love playing with this. Go back to my pen. Okay. So you start off pretty much linear here. Okay. But then at some point things level off and you end up almost completely horizontal. It's just, it's just dead. So what this is saying is that CS is no longer increasing. CS is maxed out. CW here is still increasing, right? It's still going up. But CS is going a whole lot of nowhere. So what this is saying is that you've maxed out the capacity of that, that sorbent to sorb your chemical. There's no room at the end. All of the rooms are taken. Even the crappy ones in the basement are taken, and there's just no more room in the end. And then the real problem with sorption is you get all other kinds of crazy things going on. Sometimes your sorption isotherm actually curves upward, which is bizarre, but does occasionally happen. Um, you get mixed isotherms where maybe you have two linear regions that this could mean that you first you sorb to the good stuff, which might be, I don't know, this might be the elemental carbon, which is a really good sorbent. But then when it's gone, you're left sorbing to the eh, not so great stuff, which might be the organic carbon. I don't know. All kinds of crazy things happen. So if you go in the lab and try to measure absorption isotherm, that one of the take home messages is eh, try not to be too surprised by what you get. <laughs> you could get something really crazy. Um, and part of the reason why you get these strange mixed sort of weird ass, you know, bizarre isotherms is that, again, soils and sediments are complex. They're made up of many different things. They have mineral grains, they've got elemental carbon, they've got dead leaves, they've got rubber from somebody's old shoe, 
you know, all kinds of crazy stuff shows up. I mean, I, I was, uh, uh, I, for once upon a time in my life, I sampled sewer sediment because I was very interested in sewers. I still am. Uh, but I went and sampled sewer sediment and I found a cell phone. <laughs> Is it a good sorbent? We don't know. Okay, so. Uh, we have these absorption isotherms and we can describe them with mathematical equations. And this is getting onto the example problem that I did. And anybody who took my um, analytical, excuse me, my environmental science analysis class in the fall did the same example problem because I love this problem, it's so cool. Uh, basically fitting an isotherm using these different equations. So they're named after two dead white guys, right? Freilich, which means friendly in German, and Langmuir, which I don't think means anything at all. And so the Freundlich equation is completely empirical. He just dreamed this up. This is an equation that just happens to fit the data. There's no mechanistic thing behind it. But Langmuir, this equation you can derive from first principles and it's, it's describes absorption to a limited number of sites. And if you are at all familiar with Michaelis-Menten kinetics, you might be saying, wow, that looks a lot like Michaelis-Menten kinetics. Well, absolutely, because Michaelis-Menten kinetics is about um, chemicals that react at, on enzymes. Right, and there's only so much enzyme to go around, and once all the enzyme is used up, the reaction can't go any faster. Same kind of thing is happening here. Once all the absorption sites are used up, you can't absorb anymore. So the Freundlich isotherm, because of this exponent n here, this is not a linear isotherm. n is what gives it the curvature. If n is less than one, it will curve downward, and if n is more than one, it will curve upward, right? So this, this equation can describe both of these circumstances. It just depends on what n turns out to be. If n is equal to one, then you're, you've hit the jackpot and you have a linear isotherm. But that, let's face it, that never happens. Um, and so if we define kd as cs over cw, then kd is not equal to this kf thing. It's equal to kf times CW to the n minus one power, which, you know, let's face it, who, who wants this equation? This sucks. But the point of it is just to show you that K, KD is not the same thing as KF. KF is this Freundlich constant that you get from the fitting equation and, you know, whatever, but it's not the same thing as KD. So um, back in the old days, you know, when people like me were young, uh, we would linearize this by taking the log of both sides and then it becomes a line and you can fit data to a line very easily. Even I can do that. You can do that with very minimal computing power. But nowadays we have plenty of computing power. There's no need really to linearize. I, I would suggest that you not do this and that you just fit the equation as it stands. You don't need to linearize and that's the whole point of the exercise that we did in my environmental science analysis class is that you don't need to linearize we've got all kinds of great tools now that let you do curve fitting without linearizing anyway if you want to linearize you do it this way by taking the log of both sides and if your data happens to fit the Freundlich isotherm the interpretation is that that means that you have many different types of absorption sites and they have a whole range of energies and again the the chemical will fill up the low energy sites first the really favorable ones the nice apartments with the nice view uh, and then as time goes by, the good stuff gets filled up and they start to take the, the less and less favorable sites. So this is what the Freundlich isotherm looks like again, and greater than one will curve upward and less than one will curve downward. Then we have the Langmuir equation. Again, you could derive this from first principles. You, you've probably seen this equation and you may have seen it with different, different notation. Like instead of gamma max, a lot of people would use CS max here. Whatever, it's all good. Uh, but the formula is, you know, basically gamma or CS max times KL times CW over one plus KL times CW. So I'm sure you've seen this before. If, if KL times CW is really small and much less than one, then it goes away. Eh, it goes away. Ah! Okay, so it's gone. And so then CS is just equal to gamma max over KL times CW. And that, my friend, is the formula for a line, a straight line. And there it is, straight line, okay? So that's at low concentrations of CW, which makes KL times CW really, really low, okay? But now through the magic of television, I will erase all ink on my slide and do this again. What if KL times CW is much, much greater than one so that the one part can be ignored and we can just bleh, go away, okay? Well, if that's true, then KL cancels and CW cancels and we're left with CS is equal to gamma max, i.e. CS is just constant. And that's this region over here. That's how you get this very classic shape, okay? And again, very similar to Michaelis-Menten kinetics and lots of, other, uh, lots of other kinds of relationships that we might see in the environment. So um, again, KL, 
uh, is not the same thing as KD. It's what we call the Langmuir constant. Uh, at low concentrations, KL would be equal to KD times C max. If you're really hung up on this idea of KD and you want to understand how it relates to KL, this is how it does, not that it matters. Um, but the way that you interpret this, you know, if your data fits this kind of isotherm, the way you interpret it is that the total, there's a limited number of available sites and they all have the same energy. So it just populates all those sites and then when those sites are full, game over, there's nowhere to go. Now, because we like to linearize things, the way you linearize it is by taking one over both sides and then you plot it like so, and then this is your slope and this is your intercept and yeah. But again, I'm not a big fan of linearizing. I think you ought to just, just fit the equation as given right here. There's no reason really why you need to linearize. That's why we have computers. Okay, so that's the Langmuir and the Freundlich isotherms. Um, and so that's some great theory, right? Woohoo, big, big deal, lots of theory. But in the next couple of lectures, little, little subparts of this lecture, we're gonna talk about how this really works in the real world.